right, well, welcome everyone to Elbow Lake Environmental Education Center's sixth virtual public outreach event for the summer of 2020. We are very excited to have you all with us this evening for the Black Bass 101 webinar with our very own Erin Zalderdo from the Queen's University Biological Station. We will be hosting virtual outreach events bi-weekly this summer, so please stay tuned on Elbow Lake Environmental Education Center's website and social media. My name is Lindsay Ray, and I am one of the Outreach and Stewardship Interns at the Queen's University Biological Station. Myself, along with Megan White, the other Outreach and Stewardship Intern, and Sarah Oldenberger, the Outreach and Teaching Coordinator, will be facilitating this event tonight. We are so thankful to have you all with us here tonight, and if you wish, please type your name and where you're Zooming in from into the chat box, as we would love to know if you're comfortable with sharing. We ask that you please keep your audio and video turned off throughout the webinar and type your questions into the chat box and this icon is located at the bottom of the Zoom window. We will be monitoring this chat box throughout and we will have a Q&A period at the end of the presentation. Please note that we will be recording this webinar and it will be available after this presentation on the CUBE's YouTube channel in case you need to leave early or wish to share it with your networks. We would like to begin by acknowledging the territory that we are thankful to be situated on. Queen's University is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. Specifically, the Elbow Lake Environmental Education Center is situated on unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory and is a part of the Algonquin land claim by the Algonquins of Ontario, currently under negotiation with the federal government of Canada. Acknowledgement of these facts requires recognition of the pre-colonial history of this land and the peoples who lived here and continue to live here. The culture and spiritualities of Indigenous peoples are connected to the land and the land is an integral part of their ways of knowing and living. These knowledge systems are continually evolving in relation to the land and its other inhabitants, both human and other than human. The Kingston Indigenous community continues to reflect the area's Anishinaabek and Haudenosaunee roots. There's also a significant Métis community and there are first peoples from other nations across Turtle Island present here today. I'd like to take this time to welcome and introduce our speaker for this evening. Prior to completing his Bachelor of Science in Ecology at the University of Guelph, Aaron worked on developing skills and knowledge in carpentry and automotive services. After completing his Bachelor of Science in 2012, Aaron worked with Bombardier Transportation, providing medical and electrical maintenance to Go Transit's fleet of passenger locomotives. In 2014, Aaron undertook a master's degree in biology from Carleton University. His master's focused on the physiological and behavioral impacts of stress during parental care in smallmouth bass. Following the completion of his master's, Aaron continued into a PhD at Carleton, which he is currently doing part-time. Aaron's PhD research focuses on the impacts of legacy recreational fisheries practices on black bass ecology, physiology, and behavior. Aaron, we are very excited to learn from you, and I'll pass it along to you now. All right, uh, thank you very much for the, the introduction there, Lindsay, uh, <clears throat> and uh, the opportunity to put this webinar together and share with uh, everybody that's joining us this evening. So I just wanted to add a few things here uh, before we get started to kind of help paint a picture of my deep connection to the fish species that we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, I've been in constant pursuit of bath, uh, bass, both largemouth and smallmouth, uh, since I was a small child. Uh, any and every opportunity I had, I spent on the water fishing uh, for both of these species. Uh, it was this passion for fish and fishing uh, that led me down my academic career path in fisheries research with a focus on understanding the biology management and human impacts affecting these iconic species. Uh, I also want to take uh, a moment to address the title of the talk, uh, Bass of the Rito Waterway, uh, and explain that although I address specific examples relating directly to uh, bass populations uh, with cert uh, within certain Rito Waterway lakes, uh, the biology, resource management strategies, and human impacts on these species are not entirely unique uh, to the water, uh, Rito Waterway system. Uh, and they're certainly applicable to most bass populations found within their native range. So with that, we'll get started. Okay, so I'll take a moment here just to introduce uh, the Rito Waterway. Uh, and essentially it is uh, a canal system that includes 16 lakes, uh, basically stemming from Kingston at uh, Lake Ontario all the way up to Ottawa at the Ottawa River. Uh, it is 202 kilometers in length. Uh, has 47 locks along route uh, and was recently recognized as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, I believe back in, in 2007, uh, and more recently recognized as a National Historic Site. 
<clears throat> so there are, are two species of bass found uh, throughout the Rideau waterway, uh, both largemouth and smallmouth bass. Uh, and collectively, they can be referred to as black bass. And largely, this has to do with uh, a lot of the similarities between these two species. So uh, throughout the course of this discussion tonight, I may refer to both of these species uh, as black bass if I'm referring to them collectively. Um, <clears throat> so both uh, largemouth and smallmouth are part of the sunfish family, uh, the Latin name Centrarchidea. Uh, they share this family with many other uh, iconic species, such as uh, bluegill, pumpkin seed, black crappie, and rock bass, uh, all of which are also found throughout the Rideau waterway. Um, both largemouth and smallmouth are endemic to east uh, lakes and rivers of, of uh, eastern North America, but smallmouth uh, were not initially uh, in all of the 16 Rideau waterway lakes, uh, and they were actually introduced through stocking efforts in the mid-1900s, um, to most of the lakes. So, so present day now, you can find them in basically all of uh, the entirety of the Rideau waterway system. And because of some similarities between the two species, they often get confused or mixed up uh, by anglers or, or local wildlife enthusiasts alike. So uh, before we get into the biology uh, and, and whatnot of these uh, species, I'm gonna take a moment here just to <clears throat> basically provide some uh, I guess traits or whatever characteristics to help better differentiate these two species should you come in contact with them. Um, so the, the three characteristics that I find to be uh, most distinct uh, in helping to, to identify uh, relate to base coloration, distinct markings, and mouth parts. So if we, I'm hoping you guys can see my cursor here, so if we're taking a look at the bottom figure here, we can see that the base coloration between the two is quite different. Um, largemouth bass generally have more of a, a deep true green coloration that actually uh, extends beyond the body into the fins, whereas a smallmouth bass is more bronzy uh, or even brown uh, in coloration. Uh, the other major difference is uh, this very prominent horizontal lateral line. So it's a dark uh, band of cells uh, extending all the way from the operculum, which is a gill flap here, all the way to the base of the caudal fin or, or the tail. Uh, whereas the smallmouth bass has more of a zebra striping um, uh, marking pattern. And then the other difference, as the, the name suggests, relate to the mouth parts. So uh, largemouth bass have a larger mouth. Uh, their jawline here actually extends back behind the eye, uh, whereas smallmouth bass, it only extends to in front of the eye or, or, or just uh, towards the center. So some other uh, key differences between the two species is uh, the habitats that they occupy. And habitat preferences are largely reflected by the physiology and foraging techniques uh, of both species. So largemouth bass are generally found in warm water areas. So think shallow vegetated bays. Uh, they have an optimal growing temperature between 24 and 30, uh, 30 degrees Celsius uh, with an upper lethal uh, temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. Uh, they prefer very complex uh, habitat structure within these, these uh, vegetated bays. Um, and they have very small home ranges with very limited daily movements within that home range. Comparatively, smallmouth bass prefer deeper, cooler water. So think main lake basin, um, island points, deep rock shoals. Uh, they prefer, uh, prefer a little bit cooler water between 20 and, and, and 27 degrees Celsius with an upper lethal threshold of 34 degrees Celsius. Um, and they have uh, relatively large home range uh, sizes with, with very high daily movements within their home range. So <clears throat> uh, in addition to uh, habitat differences, there's also foraging differences between both species. Uh, largemouth bass uh, are considered ambush or sit and wait predators. So what they like to do is they basically conceal themselves into uh, thick vegetation, you know, behind a stump or, or within uh, coarse woody debris structure, somewhere where they can be uh, hidden. Uh, and they essentially sit and wait for a prey species to swim by an opening where they can lunge out, grab it, and then slump back to, to, their, uh, to their hideout. Uh, and essentially they basically try to eat anything that they can grab. Uh, conversely, smallmouth bass are free swimming predators, so they roam large areas, uh, as I mentioned, they have a very large home range, uh, and they essentially travel from feeding area to feeding area to feeding area. 
Um, <clears throat> and they generally prefer to eat uh, more specific food items such as juvenile uh, fish and, and macro invertebrates. Yeah, macro uh, invertebrates. And I, I really like this picture here. Shows a, a, a crayfish doing a little bit of a dance to get away from a, a hungry smallmouth bass. So, um, aside from the differences in, in the habitat and foraging techniques, uh, both of these species have similarity in their prey capture techniques. So, both uh, species utilize ram feeding, which is where they overswim the prey uh, with their mouth open and consume the prey that way. Uh, the other form is suction feeding. So, this is where uh, the bass will rapidly expand its, its jaws, uh, creating a pressure differential between the outside environment and the inside mouth cavity. Uh, in, in doing so, it creates an inward force of water, uh, and presumably the prey item is in that water as well. So if you're small fish and this is what you're seeing, you're in trouble. Uh, so other similarities um, are in the prey resources that, uh, that these species um, utilize. Uh, both uh, largemouth and smallmouth bass are opportunistic predators, meaning that their diet changes to match the prey source and density in the lake or habitat they happen to be in. Um, the other factor is that these fish are gape limited predators, meaning they can eat anything that they can fit in their mouth and swallow whole. So, uh, some other similarities between these two species uh, relate to their reproductive life history strategies. Um, both largemouth and smallmouth bass utilize a form of parental care known as paternal parental care. So, what this is is that it means the the dad is responsible for for raising the young until they reach a state of independence. Uh, and this, the parental care period, um, is by far the most critical life stage uh, for, for bass, uh, as the young are literally completely dependent upon the dad to, to make it to that independent state. So the parental care period uh, begins in the spring. So essentially once temperature, water temperature has reached that 12 to 14 degrees Celsius mark, uh, this triggers bass to move up into the shallow littoral regions of, of lake and river systems, uh, where then they uh, establish a nesting site and then excavate uh, a nest in the bottom substrate using their, their tail or, or even their mouth. They can pick things up and, and move them out of the nesting, uh, nesting area. Um, so similarly to the habitat that they normally prefer, they also have preferences in, in where they develop these nest sites. Uh, Largemouth bass uh, prefer to be in vegetated, uh, woody debris substrate, generally at a nest depth of, of uh, uh, half a meter to two meters in depth. Comparatively, smallmouth uh, prefer rocky, gravelly substrate. Uh, they can nest up a little bit deeper, basically down to about three meters or so. Uh, they also prefer to uh, establish nest sites basically adjacent to deep water. So again, think islands, uh, island shores um, uh, and, and, and points. Some place where there's access to deep water. So <clears throat> once water temperatures uh, hit that 14 to 15 degrees Celsius mark, that is when spawning actually begins. So this will trigger the females to move up uh, into these shallow littoral regions to uh, choose a male and then uh, deposit her eggs in, in his nest. So I've got some video clips here and I really hope that they come through. Um, so this video clip here is of uh, uh, a smallmouth bass pair that are undergoing spawning. I'll kind of commentate over top of it. So the female is in the center of the nest and the male is courting her and kind of corralling her towards that center of the nest. So the female will spawn basically egg by egg, singly, uh, when she turns on her side. And when she does that, the male then um, admits his, his, uh, his sperm, which fertilizes the eggs, and then they are uh, deposited in the nest. Okay, so largemouth females uh, can produce between 2,000 and 7,000 eggs per half kilogram of body mass. 
Uh, and generally, they, they can deposit between 2,000 and, and, and 25,000 eggs per spawning bout. Um, the main, that's also very similar to smallmouth. So the, the main difference between largemouth and smallmouth eggs really comes down to the size. Uh, largemouth bass eggs have a diameter of about 1.6 millimeters, uh, whereas smallmouth, uh, 2.3 millimeters. And this is a, a great picture, a great close-up picture of freshly deposited and fertilized smallmouth bass eggs. And you can kind of see they're more or less transparent, but in the center, there's a, a little droplet of kind of gold looking um, substance. And that's actually the, the egg yolk, uh, the nutrients that the, that the larva use to, to grow and develop. So uh, there are four main stages of brood development um, with temperature being the biggest influential factor. Um, we're gonna work through each of, these, uh, each of these brood stages, but the one thing I want to, to draw your attention to on this slide um, is the, the variation uh, in developmental days per, uh, per each of these stages. So what creates that variation is water temperature. So a good kind of rule of thumb here is the warmer the water, the faster the development. So the egg stage of, of development is really the biggest difference between largemouth and smallmouth bass. Largemouth bass generally, uh, eggs generally transition to the next stage by two to seven days, whereas smallmouth, it's, it's about four to 11 days. So once the eggs transition to the next stage, which is known as egg sac fry, um, this is where they actually start to take on some, some anatomical features of fish. So they actually start to develop um, eyes, a head, uh, a body shape, a tail, and so on. But they don't have functioning mouth parts at this stage just yet. So they're still completely reliant upon uh, the nutrients of the of the yolk to to uh, further development. So once they make that transition from egg sac fry to now swim up fry, they've now basically absorbed all of that all of that egg sac, all of that yolk. Uh, their their mouth parts are now functioning, and they're they're able to start foraging and finding food on their own. Uh, at this stage, they're completely eating um, uh, plankton or or uh, little tiny macro invertebrates if they can find them. Um, they start to develop a little bit of, of anti-predator uh, behaviors um, as they can start to swim a little bit, but they generally only swim uh, vertically uh, in the water columns. So they only kind of travel up and down. They don't spread out from the nest at this stage just yet. <clears throat> the next stage uh, is what we term the free swimming fry stage. Uh, so this is where uh, the, the fry start to actually uh, develop all of their, their anatomical features. They start to take on the markings of the species. So as we talked about before, um, both species can be, can be identified by distinct color and, and markings. This is a largemouth bass and, and, and you can tell basically because of this very distinct prominent uh, black lateral line traveling the, the entirety of the body. At this stage, they, these fish start to travel uh, a little bit further outside of the nest along shorelines. Um, and again, they're, they're, they're able to eat and, and find food for themselves. And at this stage, they've, they've uh, started to, to really develop anti-predator behaviors. So there are two, two main behaviors or, or parental care behaviors displayed by the nest guarding males. Uh, the first being nest defense. So this is where the parental male basically chases away or attacks any brood predators that try to get into the nest site um, to score a free meal. Um, this parental care behavior is extremely energetically demanding. Um, we have research to show that, that, that these parental males can swim upwards of 40 kilometers a day, chasing away brood predators um, from the nest without actively leaving the nest site. Um, and it's because of this behavior is what makes them very vulnerable uh, to angling capture during this life stage. Um, bass don't know how to differentiate between um, a bluegill, a natural nest predator, and a fishing lure, or even a duck or a person. Virtually anything that comes into the nest site is considered a threat and they react accordingly. Um, another thing that's kind of interesting about this as well is that, um, and to go hand in hand with the, the energetic demand, is that these bass stop eating. They don't forage uh, during the parental care period. So all of the energy needed to, to power the parental care behaviors is actually from built up energy stores from the previous growing season. Yeah, I'm sorry, and here's a video clip 
showing uh, an aggressive parental small nerve bass. As you can see, he's not too happy with us being around his nest right now. But this kind of goes to show you how aggressive they can be. The other uh, category of, of parental behaviors uh, is nest tending or, or the housekeeping behaviors. I'm going to play this video and talk over it. <clears throat> so this is where the parental male will position himself on top of the nest uh, and will rotate all of his fins in, in, in an effort to circulate fresh oxygenated water uh, over the nest site and at the same time clear away any silt uh, and debris that might be building up. All right, so uh, brood development beyond the nest. So uh, one question I, I, I have gotten before in the past is, is if temperature is so important for brood development, why do bass spawn in the cold spring? Why not wait till the warm weather uh, months of, of summer? And essentially the, the answer to this is that bass need to time their reproduction with what food will be available. So bass fry must make the shift to a fish-based diet during the first growing season. Uh, this is why bass spawn before their primary prey species, the bluegill, uh, so that the bass fry will have enough time to, to grow and reach uh, the size needed to utilize bluegill fry as a main food source. So essentially, they need time to grow to, uh, to stay ahead of any gape limitations that may, uh, that may occur later on in the season. Uh, and essentially, they need to grow rapidly. They need to, they need, for them to transition from uh, plankton and macroinvertebrates to a fish-based diet, they have to be essentially a minimum of 10 centimeters long. Um, and their overwinter survival depends on it. If they don't hit that threshold, uh, it's likely they won't last over the winter time. So if bass fry are lucky enough to survive uh, through their first winter, they'll grow rapidly beyond that time period. So generally they'll reach a size of, of 120 to 200 millimeters uh, by the end of their second growing season. So one and a half years old. Uh, generally males, and this is true for both species, generally males will reach sexual maturity by the age of three or five, whereas females take a little bit longer to develop uh, and they reach sexual maturity at four to six years. And one really interesting thing about, about uh, uh, black bass and, and fish in general is that they're considered indeterminate growers. Uh, and this means that they never really stop growing with respect to their environment. Uh, so as long as energy intake exceeds energy needs for maintenance and reproduction, bass will continue to grow uh, in size throughout their lifetime. And we know that bass are a relatively long-lived species. Uh, <clears throat> we know that the oldest largemouth bass on record is 15 years old, smallmouth 23 years old. Um, however, they could very well live much longer than this. We don't really know because current aging techniques um, require lethal sampling. Um, the reason for that is because uh, bass fish have inner ear bones that grow very similar to what you know about a tree and, and how trees grow on a, a on an annual basis, they, they develop a ring, while the inner ear bone of fish do the exact same thing. So this is a cross section of one of those um, inner ear bones of a fish. And you can see emanating outward from the center here, each of these dark lines represent one growing year. And you can see the first couple of years, this fish is growing rapidly. They start to slow down a little bit as they get older. But anyways, there's ethical dilemmas. You don't wanna kill a big healthy looking fish just to get its age. So again, we know that they can live long, we just don't know how long they can live for. Okay, so that will conclude the biology section of, of the discussion. I've, I've included a few links here to resources should anybody uh, be interested in, in reading and, and, and learning a little bit more. Um, and I'm willing to take any questions if, if you guys have any uh, up until this point. Thanks so much, Aaron. I've already learned so much in the first half of your presentation. If anyone has any questions, feel free to type them into the chat box below. We can just take a couple minutes, I think. We can wait to the end, too. No pressure. Yeah, and if you don't think of any right now, that's totally fine. We can just save them to the end, too. Yeah, Lindsay, you just let me know and we'll get going.
if nobody puts in a cord. Sounds good. Oh, we have a question. Can you use an MRI to take a picture of the age rings? I take a picture of what, sir? Um, use an MRI to take a picture of the age rings. I think they mean on the ear bone. Uh, that's a great question. Um, and, and one that I, I definitely do not have an answer to. Uh, I don't know if you can because otoliths need to be prepared before they can actually be um, properly evaluated. So generally what that means is they have to be kind of cut in half and then they have to be really finely sanded down so you can actually differentiate the rings. I don't know if MRI technology would allow that type of um, um, ability to, to, to visualize the rings. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about that. Good question though. Yeah, thank you. Have another question, not sure if this was covered, but do bass mate for life? They do not. Um, females, so that, that is one thing I didn't mention. Um, so a female can in basically lay eggs in, in multiple male nests. They don't, she doesn't have to choose just one individual. Um, and generally what she will do is she might hedge her bets and pick a few of the best males in a spawning area and distribute her eggs accordingly amongst them to give her the highest chance of, of having reproductive success for that year. So um, no, they don't mate for life. And, and generally they, they, they mate with multiple partners per season or can mate with multiple partners per season. Awesome, thank you. Now I have another question. How do you feel COVID has affected this year's growing season for bass? Uh, <clears throat> the growing season, I, I don't know so much about the growing season, but it's had a tremendous impact on um, reducing the pre-season fisheries for bass, essentially. And that's something I'm going to talk about uh, in the latter half of this discussion is um, some of the current modern day impacts on black bass. And, and, and one of the big ones is um, pre-season uh, catch and release for, for nesting um, males. So COVID has had a very good effect on um, reducing pre-season fisheries. So it's been really good for fish. Hey, these are good questions, everyone. They are great questions. Yeah. That's all I have at the moment for questions. All right. Please feel free to keep adding questions in the chat box and then we can ask them again at the end. <clears throat> okay, so uh, thanks, Lindsay. Um, so we'll keep going here with the, the management and human impacts uh, portion of, of tonight's discussion. Um, so there, there are many threats that face fresh, uh, fresh, ugh, freshwater fish communities in Ontario, uh, including black bass. So some of you may not know this, but black bass are the most sought after sport fish in North America uh, and have been historically. It's, they're, they're uh, yeah, very, very popular. And due to this extensive angling popularity, uh, they've been subjected to diverse and complex management, uh, making these two of the most heavily managed species in the Rideau waterway system, which we'll get into further detail here. So uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, uh, I will focus the management and human impacts discussion section on bass populations of the Rideau waterway using specific examples from a particular lake, Pentagon Lake. Uh, I've chosen to draw examples specifically from a Pentagon Lake as the black bass population in this lake has been subjected to extensive MNR documentation over time, uh, as well as research by independent university institutions thanks to the presence of the Queen's University Biological Station, which is set up um, on the shores of a Pentagon Lake. Um, <clears throat> however, the data trends uh, that I will show, uh, which are based on these Pentagon bass populations, are transferable to populations found throughout the Rideau Waterway lakes. So the black bass fishery in the Rideau uh, system has predominantly focused on largemouth bass, uh, largely due to angler preference, but also due to the fact that smallmouth bass were not always present in all of the 16 uh, Rideau Waterway lakes. Uh, in most lakes, stocking efforts to establish smallmouth bass didn't occur until the 1950s. Uh, this impacted angler preference as it took a bit of time uh, for this species to get established, uh, as well for anglers to learn how and where to catch them. Uh, so up until the mid-1900s, largemouth bass were the main species targeted by anglers. Um, as such, a lot of the data I'll present on historical fisheries will focus solely on largemouth bass. 
<clears throat> so here's a figure uh, showing angling effort as measured by rod hours for largemouth bass and other species on a Pinnacon Lake. Uh, so I was able to get data uh, as far back as 1946. So we can see basically between 1946 and 1961 that angler effort was 100% focused on largemouth bass. Uh, by the 80s, that's when the fishery uh, of the Pinnacon Lake and largely the Rideau waterway started to diversify a little bit. Um, so this, this orange bar here represents broad hours um, targeted at the, other species, not largemouth bass. So things like northern pike, um, uh, bluegill, black crappie, smallmouth bass, uh, and so on. So uh, the take home message from this figure is just showing how prominent, how dominant um, largemouth bass are from a fisheries perspective. <clears throat> so there were counts of commercial fisheries for black bass dating back to the mid 1800s. So Local farmers in the area would turn to commercial fisheries in the shoulder seasons uh, to help make a little bit of money. Uh, they would use any means to catch fish, uh, which they would sell uh, at the Kingston market. Uh, on a Pinnacon Lake, the predominant species harvested were largemouth bass and northern pike. It's this commercial fishery that actually paved the way for the recreational fishery, uh, as these farmers soon, uh, soon turned to guiding, uh, where they would take out tourists onto the lake to catch fish during the summer months. Uh, guiding throughout the Rideau Waterway was very popular uh, and was heavily active up into the, the mid 1900s. Uh, the growth of the recreational fishery was a huge economic driver for local businesses in the area. However, catch and release wasn't yet uh, a concept practice. Uh, so most fish that were captured were, were harvested. This is a, a very old picture of a fishing club, the Apinicon Club, um, back in the, the early 1900s. You see all of these fish big, beautiful, healthy fish, and they were all harvested. So guides would routinely report catches between 50 and 100 largemouth bass during a single fishing outing, um, and early accounts of harvest rates greater than 60%. However, unfortunately, um, the, the guides and, and the, the participants would maybe keep one or two fish for themselves, but the rest would be fed to livestock. Um, so a lot of waste. So the heavy harvest rates uh, were not sustainable for the largemouth bass populations and led to the development of some very progressive management strategies for this species. So, uh, and again, to go back, um, black bass in general are, are the most in, intensely managed species. And, and these are some of the management strategies that were put in place to try to protect the populations. So such as closed fishing seasons, um, slot sizes, bag limits, um, stocking efforts to try to alleviate some of the, the exploitation. Um, and also, which is, which is more or less unique to the Rito waterway, the um, establishment of no fishing zones or largemouth bass sanctuaries. Uh, and these were established in four of the, of the 16 lakes, uh, Pinnacon Lake being one, uh, Sand Lake, Newborough Lake, as well as Big Rito Lake. So believe, uh, or sorry, uh, catch and release really didn't come about until the 1970s. Um, uh, believe it or not, uh, catch and release practices were originally developed by a bass fishing club known as the Bass Anglers Sportsman Society. Uh, so who were catching flack from locals for having these big bass fishing tournaments uh, and they were killing a lot of really big healthy fish just for sport. Um, so the bad PR led uh, the club to adopting a catch and release policy uh, where all tournament anglers basically had to weigh in and release live fish or they'd be penalized. Uh, from then on, catch and release practices took off, but they were slow to, to catch on in Ontario. Uh, and it really didn't take, take effect or, or wasn't really the prominent angler behavior until about the 90s. Uh, since its inception, though, catch and release has been uh, really positive or has had a really positive impact on, on the bass fisheries uh, in general. So here's a figure here just kind of showcasing the, the change or the shift in angler uh, behavior over time. And again, I was able to get data, uh, catch and harvest data dating back to the 1960s. So we can see here, uh, the blue line represents um, the harvest of largemouth bass, whereas the uh, orange line represents um, release, catch and release. So in 1960, we can see harvest rates higher than 60%, um, more or less modern day year, we can see uh, uh, harvest rates at, at about 10% or release rates at about 90%. Uh, <clears throat> okay. 
Yeah, so due to the intensive management uh, and, and increase in catch and release behavior amongst anglers, we would think that the bass populations are, are doing really well, but that doesn't really seem to be the case. Um, there's really, there's a lot of several new age challenges that, that threaten black bass populations uh, right here in the Rideau uh, waterway system. So a few that I'm gonna to touch on uh, for this discussion uh, include habitat alteration, uh, invasive species, as well as pre-season fisheries pressure. We'll talk about each of these uh, individually here moving forward. So habitat alteration, the problems, what, what this really is, it's, it's human development along the lake shore or river shore, it's agricultural activities in the area, it's dam, canal construction, it's seasonal water level drawdown to protect docks and infrastructure, uh, it's shoreline development in general, so whether it be installing a dock, a beach, a retaining wall, you name it. Um, all these land use activities can increase siltation and turbidity in the aquatic environment. So as bass are visual predators that prefer non-turbid habitat, uh, increased turbidity can impact foraging abilities, which can essentially lead to, to habitat abandonment. Furthermore, increased siltation can cover vital spawning habitat, reducing off offspring survival and development, generally reducing uh, reproductive success overall. Uh, and we know that bass are, are a structure-oriented uh, fish. Uh, they love to hang out under logs and vegetation and behind stumps, so efforts to clear areas for beaches can stir water, uh, stir up water bodies. Um, and if, if enough of this vital habitat is degraded or destroyed, it can have uh, some significant population level impacts. So <clears throat> some solutions, uh, all of these are pretty well intuitive. So one, some of the things that you can do are protect natural shoreline areas. Uh, keep these habitat features in place. So don't remove stumps, don't remove coarse woody debris, don't dredge um, the vegetation out in front of your dock, um, leave it for the fish. If shoreline work is needed to be done, um, like you need to install a dock or fix a retaining wall, wait until the end of the parental care period. Um, you'll be doing the bass a favor. So the, the next factor that's uh, a potential big threat for black bass is uh, the presence of invasive species. So if an invasive species gets into an aquatic habitat, it can dramatically change the predator-prey dynamics uh, and can have irreversible um, uh, impacts on the ecosystem overall. Um, there are a number of invasive species. I'm not going to get into them. Uh, uh, I'm not going to get into all of them uh, for the purposes of this talk, but just in general. Um, Invasive species can be introduced a variety of different ways, bait bucket uh, introductions uh, through bilge water, uh, as well as hitching a ride on, on boat hulls, propellers, trailers, you name it. Um, and I, I will draw your attention to the round goby picture up here at the top. Uh, I love this picture as it showcases two prolific invaders, uh, the zebra mussel and the round goby, both originally from Eurasia and thought to have been introduced uh, into the Great Lakes through ballast water of uh, ships uh, since their introduction. They have spread through a number of inland lakes and river systems. Although not present in all of the Rideau waterway lakes yet, the round goby is making its way up from the St. Lawrence and downward from the Ottawa River. Uh, the round goby is particularly bad for black bass as they are ferocious nest predators and can significantly reduce the reproductive success of black bass at a lake wide level. So these are uh, a big threat coming this way. So some solutions. Um, Follow the careful cleaning and sanitation guidelines when moving between water bodies. Um, clean your boat, watercraft, whatever it is. Um, and don't ever transport and release any live animals between one lake uh, and another. Regardless if it's found in one lake or in both lakes, never transport live animals. So the last <clears throat> uh, and, and uh, big uh, uh, factor in impacting black bass populations is pre-season fisheries. Um, Preseason fisheries unintentionally or intentionally targeting nesting black bass uh, can hurt the reproductive output of the population. When a parental male, when a, sorry, when a parental male is removed from the nest, uh, nest predators rush into the nest and begin consuming the brood. 50% of the young can be consumed within eight minutes of that parental male being removed from the nest. If enough of the brood uh, are predated, the male will abandon the nest, resulting in the entire brood being eaten by predators. Uh, which can have lake-wide consequences for reproductive output. And we are seeing this issue in, in real time at a population level on a Pentagon Lake. 
uh, preseason capture of nesting bass is leading to a decrease in several reproductive parameters, including reproductive success. Although fishing for bass during the closed season of December 15th to the third Saturday in June is illegal, fishing for other species such as northern pike uh, is allowed. Uh, and unfortunately, the open access of other sport fish uh, is leading to unintentional and in some cases intentional capture of nest guarding bass. Um, this figure here uh, represents, uh, sorry, shows that hook wounding percentage, which is uh, the black line here, uh, of nesting bass increases. There's a proportional decrease in a variety of reproductive parameters. Um, <clears throat> so if this can, if this continued, sorry, if this continued uh, trajectory doesn't change, it doesn't really bode well for the future of, of the black bass population on the Pinnacon Lake. And this is really interesting too because this is a long-term data set that we've been working on basically dating back to the 90s up into present day. So some solutions here, um, don't target nesting males in the spring. Even though you're practicing catch and release or you think it's not having any impact, it is. You pull the male off the nest, predators get in and start to eat the brood. Um, if that happens enough times, it can lead to abandonment, and, and we are definitely seeing that. Um, and also, if you are fishing in the early season, don't fish in nesting habitat. So as we spoke about earlier in the biology section, it's quite easy to predict where bass nests will be in the spring. Um, so avoid those areas if you're going out fishing. If you do happen to catch a bass in the spring, make sure you release it as quickly as possible. Don't take your time to admire it or, or take pictures of it. Um, get it back into the water quickly. Um, the last thing you can do is report poaching. Um, you don't have to get in a confrontation with, with people if, if you see people out there uh, fishing for nesting bass, but what you can do is you can take a picture of the boat license number or write it down on a piece of paper and, uh, and report it to the MNR. So <clears throat> some other bigger solutions that need to happen to improve uh, or reduce preseason fisheries is either increased enforcement. Um, so I know the MNR has a very tight budget when it comes to enforcement. Um, FMZ 18, which is the fisheries management zone, um, which encompasses a lot of the, the Rito uh, waterway lakes, I, I believe has only eight enforcement officers. So more money, more, more allocation of resources to enforcement would go a long way. The other thing, the other potential solution could be the implementation of spawning sanctuaries. Uh, and this would essentially be a, an exclusion zone during the spawning and parental care period where no fishing is, is allowed, regardless uh, if it's for pike or, or anything that, that happens to be open, it's a complete exclusion zone. And that would also likely help with reducing what we're seeing here. And with that, I will leave it there for the, uh, for the management and human impacts. Um, again, I included a few more resources uh, should anybody want to do a little bit more reading. Um, thank you all very much for, for hanging out tonight and uh, participating. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to field them. Great. Thank you so much, Aaron, for sharing your knowledge with us on Black Bass. And thanks for taking time out of your Thursday night to be here with us. And same for everyone else as well, zooming in near and far. Um, we're glad to have you with us tonight. And if anyone has any questions, we would love to hear them. All right, so we have a question. Is the MNR involved in restocking fish in any of these areas? Um, <clears throat> yes and no, but not black bass. Uh, they don't stock bass anymore. It's all reliant on natural reproduction. However, the MNR does stock other species such as splake, um, which is a, a recreationally created species um, to alleviate fishing pressure on, on uh, natural lake trout populations. So they do actively stock those throughout the Rito waterway, uh, but that's more or less it. Awesome, thank you. Another question. Has climate change and increasing water temperatures had an effect on the black bass? Uh, yeah, so really climate change is, is likely gonna have a, a, a positive impact on, on bass. Um, as we kind of talked about before, um, bass are quite hardy. They have pretty wide thermal thresholds um, and they, yeah, they, they can basically eat anything. So. With warming water temperatures, what's likely going to happen is you're going to get range expansion. 
Um, so these fish are going to be able to make their way uh, into more northerly waters where they may not have been able to inhabit before. Um, now, it may also, uh, on the southern side of things, it may also make waters too hot. So uh, particularly for smallmouth bass, you could see a range shift uh, for that species. Um, but I think largemouth bass, will they're going to do more or less better because of this. Awesome, thanks. Yeah. I have another question. Do most of the lakes in the Rideau Waterway have already established sanctuaries? Four of them do. So there's four lakes that have established um, uh, fish sanctuaries that include Sand Lake, Apinicon Lake, Newboro Lake, and Big Rideau Lake. And uh, they're, they're, these are really interesting areas. They, they were actually established back in the 1930s and 40s, and they were particularly put in place to offset or to, to help um, uh, alleviate the exploitation on the largemouth bass populations at the time and they were largely put forward by the fishing guides at the time because they were noticing that um, hey you know our, our fish stocks are, are kind of going in the toilet here we got to do something so think about how progressive that would have been in the 1930s you have um, fishing guides tabling this idea to the resource manager saying hey we got to we got to provide exclusion zones and, and these exclusion zones are going to do one of two things they're going to um, a, they're going to isolate a proportion of the population from exploitation, but also they're going to provide a source to reseed the lake. Um, and anyway, so, so they, they, they put them in, uh, in the four lakes that I just mentioned, and they've been in place ever since. Um, so they're almost 100 years old, and, and really they're super unique because they're, they're, they're active 365 days a year, they're, they're super old, and really they're, they're unique to Ontario, right? We don't really have a, a lot of uh, uh, fish sanctuaries. So yeah, four lakes, they're really awesome. So. Yeah, thank you. I have another question. Do bass accrue mercury levels in the Rideau like they do in the Great Lakes? I'm wondering. Yes, they do. Um, I, so they, the MNR was a ministry environment. One of them puts out a, a consumption guide uh, for a lot of, for most of the, the, the lakes in, I guess it'd be Ontario. Um, I don't know what the mercury differences are for, for example, a Pinnacon Lake versus the, the Great Lakes, but they definitely do uh, accrue toxins. So you, you should check it out and, and check out what the consumption guidelines are before you, uh, before you eat fish. Sounds good. Okay. Another question. How far will the larger mouth bass venture out from a sanctuary? Well, that's a great question. And uh, so, so my, my PhD research is actually focused on, or one component is looking at the effectiveness of these fish sanctuaries um, at doing what they were supposed to do. And one of the questions, one of my, my data chapters um, is looking at, it, it's, a, it's an acoustic telemetry project where we actually went into uh, the sanctuary on uh, Big Rito Lake, we tagged 50 largemouth bass of different sizes. We set up a telemetry array and basically tracked these fish through time. Um, and what we found is they are protected for a large proportion of, of the active fishing season, but they do travel outward of these sanctuaries in the, um, in the fall and into the winter. And we largely believe that's because they travel out of the shallow water areas into the deeper main lake basins where they prefer to overwinter. So in the winter time, we, again, you know, we don't really know a lot, what, a lot of what bass do in the winter, um, or even at night, really. There's a lot of, there's a, there's a few black box areas in, in, in bass biology. Winter is one of them. But we do know that bass tend to kind of all huddle together in the winter in generally in, in, in deep pockets of lakes. We think that they do that because the water is a little bit warmer and it's denser in oxygen. So um, they kind of hang out and they wait for the spring, they wait for the thaw, and they start the whole parental care period and, and growth period over again. So to answer, your, to go back to the, the original question, it depends on the sanctuary. And the one on Big Rito shows that it is effective most of the time, but they do travel outwards in, in the fall and in the winter. Wow, that's cool. Another question. Fishing regulations vary by place. 
are there any countries who manage opening season depending on climate conditions, meaning not with the calendar date, but rather more with the climate? And mm -hmm. should we be doing this with increasing unpredictability in our spring transitions with timing? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. Um, and, and that's kind of what works me a little bit too with, with current MNR um, regulations. We generally in Ontario have a, a one size fits all opening date for bass fishing. Um, where we are, FMZ 18, um, it's the third Saturday in June. Um, I know other parts of the province, it's the fourth Saturday. But anyways, um, as we mentioned, as, as we learned earlier tonight, temperature is absolutely everything when it comes to developmental time. Um, we know even within FMZ 18 that there are lakes where the bass will never be done by the third Saturday of June because the lakes are too big, too deep, too cold. They don't heat up quick enough in the spring. So inevitably, there's always going to be a portion of, uh, of nesting um, individuals that are gonna be susceptible to being captured and removed from their nest. Um, there's no areas that I know of that, that have the, the lake by lake management or the, the climate management. Um, it's even worse in the States. In the States, most of them don't even have a closed fishing season in, during, the, during the parental care period. Uh, so they're open, the, the bass fishery is open 365 days a year, which is in a lot of areas decimated their, their bass fishery. Um, but yeah, so because they're, they're endemic to, to um, uh, North America, in Canada and in, in the States, there are no, that I know of anyways, there are no, um, um, I guess you could say, real time or on demand changes to the, the opening day for, for black bass, no. Oh, thank you. And it might be all the questions for now. Perfect. But thank you everyone for sharing your insightful questions and thank you, Aaron, for sharing your expertise with us as well. Oh, happy to do it. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Well, we had one last question. Should the MNR encourage barbless hooks for CNR catch and release? Ah, uh, that's a project we're working on right now. Um, looking at hook type um, as well as lure type on um, basically handling time. Uh, I don't. We don't. We don't know the answer yet to that to that question. Um, stay tuned. A couple of thank yous coming in.